Hi there. We have been talking about smooth muscle with in the vessels, but we haven't really talked about the anatomy or the physiology of smooth muscle too much. So that's what these next two lectures are going to focus on. And we're now on worksheet 8.1. For the memes, we got a student submission down here in the bottom left. Uh, <laughs> it says, I don't know what this dude is going through, but I feel him. Must have been a low point with students around this time last year. And we got, I love this meme format. It says, when you pick a silly Britney Spears song for your friend Brian to sing at the karaoke bar and you're waiting on the DJ to call his name. And we got, I'll take this goth pear, cashier, that's an avocado. And then since we were talking about the hypothalamus yesterday, I figured I'd throw this in there. We got the four Fs. This is in the textbook. It says, the hypothalamus plays a major role in the regulation of basic biological drives related to survival, including the so-called four Fs, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and mating. Not sure I get that one. We'll begin today by talking about some of the general properties of smooth muscle and then looking at some of the various locations and organs where smooth muscle is found within the body. And to kick us off today, we have some cadaver footage from our friends at the Institute of Human Anatomy types of muscle in your body and the first is called skeletal muscle and we can see that here in the pectoralis major or the deltoid or biceps brachii it's basically all the muscles that you can voluntarily move that are attached to your skeleton now the next type of muscle is called cardiac muscle and it's only found in your heart now this is fat actually so if i lift the heart up we can see some of that cardiac muscle right there but this is obviously going to be involuntary because you can't decide when to contract your heart the third type of muscle is called smooth muscle, and it's found in many different places in the body, but we can find it inside of your digestive tract. And smooth muscle is also involuntary, so what'll happen is, in the digestive tract at least, it will contract to help push all the digestive material through the entire tract, from point A all the way down to point B. And why not have another video to kick us off here? So while that last uh, clip was helpful in showing us where smooth muscle can be found in the body, Let's take a look at some actual smooth muscle and some uh, defining characteristics here with Dr. Christian. This guy's pretty animated and he loves to get into the editing, so this video is pretty fun. This is smooth muscle and this is skeletal muscle. There's a lot of similarities. They're both contractile, they both have actin and myosin as their main proteins. They both have calcium as their trigger for contraction and ATP as their power for contraction. But how are they different? Let's have a look initially at the colors. You can nearly see through smooth muscle. It's completely smooth as the name describes, but it's a far pastier color. Skeletal muscle is much redder. It's this stored myoglobin as it comes in contact with the oxygen. There's a far greater store of oxygen and blood and nutrients in skeletal muscle because it uses them so much more ravenously than in smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is this sort of a pasty white color normally. Skeletal muscle a much darker color. Even when you get things like a chicken breast, the skeletal muscle it still it looks quite after it's been cooked, but it's still that pinkish red color, far more rich than you find in your average smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is a far slower process. The contraction is about 10 times more energy efficient in smooth muscle than in skeletal muscle, but it happens far slower. Skeletal muscle has these beautiful, regular contractile elements. It has striations. It has lined up multinucleic fibers, whereas smooth muscle tends to look more like a jumble of cells. The main differences between skeletal muscle and smooth muscle is the gorgeous way in which skeletal muscle is arranged to contract in one direction. These fascicles are full of muscle fibers. The fibers are one of the longest cells in the body, multinucleic. And if you zoom in and look, they're actually striated. This is just because they're so beautifully arranged. They're lined up perfectly as they develop in the body. Smooth muscle, on the other hand, is jumbled together in all different directions. And when we build it up, it looks something like this. Smooth muscle are jumbles of cells, which is in stark contract to our skeletal muscle, which are arranged in perfect parallel with multiple nuclei. 
The differences between these cells can be summed up from the sole idea that skeletal muscle is designed to be in perfect parallel, lined up to perfectly contract in one direction, whereas smooth muscle contracts in all kinds of directions in tissue. It's not a line and it doesn't need to be. Smooth muscle can be found throughout the body and it makes up on average about 2% of an adult's body weight. Now, in that Institute of Anatomy video, we looked at the intestines and we said that smooth muscle is typically found within the walls of organs, and that can be within many different body systems, and it can have a variety of different roles. So to start us off, I would think pair share, where are some locations smooth muscle can be found that we've mentioned previously, or maybe you know of some offhand? The two we've mentioned more recently that you probably thought of would be the cardiovascular system. So the blood vessels, they have that layer, the tunica media, that smooth muscle layer that helps alter blood pressure and the distribution and flow of blood. And then also within the digestive system, the stomach, the intestines, um, the smooth muscle there helps to mix, propel material that we've ingested. And there are some locations of smooth muscle we haven't talked about too much. So, for example, the bronchioles. So we had a bronchiole. Here we're blowing up uh, one of these bronchioles, and we can see that the walls of these airways have smooth muscle as well. And in that way, we can control the airflow to the alveoli of the lungs, the air sacs where gas exchange occurs. We also see smooth muscle within the, ureter, uh, the ureters of the urinary system. So the ureters then propel urine from the kidneys to the bladder, which is also smooth muscle. And then finally, we have the uterus of the female reproductive system. So that's uterine muscle. Um, as an example, my wife right now is nine months pregnant, and she is having what are called Braxton Hicks contractions. These are contractions that help tone the uterus, this smooth muscle here, and prepare it for labor to deliver that baby. Not only is smooth muscle found within the walls of hollow organs, we also see that it composes some other special structures we've talked about before. So, for example, the iris of the eye. The iris can uh, dilate or constrict, and that helps control the amount of light that enters the eye and hits the retina. Also, we've spoken about the ciliary body of the eye. And remember, that's that structure that flattens the lens. So remember that when it contracts, these suspensory ligaments get loose and this takes on a more spherical shape, the lens. And then also the erector pili. And these are found at the base of hair follicles. And when those smooth muscles contract, lifts that hair up and gives us the goosebumps. Smooth muscle, as we'll see shortly, is pretty unique and different from skeletal and cardiac muscle. However, it, there are some shared similarities between them. And the first is they all contract by actin filaments sliding over myosin. And this is in response to a rise within calcium within the cytosol of the cell. The second thing is they directly use ATP as an energy source to power the contraction of, or that power stroke, with the myosin head. Another shared characteristic between the three muscle types is that the muscle cell size can increase, and we call this hypertrophy. Now, smooth muscle, additionally, it's able to increase the cell number, which we call hyperplasia. So let's look at a couple examples here. An example of hypertrophy we talked about lately in regards to smooth muscle was the thickening of vessel walls due to hypertension or high blood pressure. So in order to counteract that higher blood pressure, the vessel walls push back on that blood and over time we get thickening of that vessel wall. And that's due to hypertrophy or the enlargement of those muscle cells. Another example of hypertrophy with smooth muscle we just mentioned is the thickening of the smooth muscle of the uterus during pregnancy. So here we have that muscle layer, the myometrium, 
and the cells of the myometrium, the muscle cells, smooth muscle cells, are going to enlarge. This is hypertrophy. And at the same time, they are going to increase in cell number. And this is called hyperplasia. So these cells are going to undergo mitosis, divide, and give rise to more smooth muscle cells. Now, this mitotic ability of smooth muscle allows for regeneration should there be an injury. And that restores us to the original state and function as we could before. So this is an additional property of smooth muscle that is advantageous compared to the other two types of muscle. We'll turn now to the microanatomy of smooth muscle. Start by asking you a simple question. How many smooth muscle cells are shown here? Well, there are in fact four. And we can identify them because they have a single nucleus, a single centrally located nucleus. We can also see this characteristic spindle shape, or what we call a fusiform shape, of the smooth muscle cell. And so a lot of fish are shaped this way. They, they're said to have fusiform shaped bodies. It tends to look like a football, if you want to think of it that way, or they're spindle shaped. Now, some other characteristics are that the smooth muscle cells do not extend the full length of the muscle, as we saw with uh, skeletal muscle fibers, for example. In fact, they're a thousand times shorter than skeletal muscle fibers, and they have one-tenth the diameter of a skeletal muscle fiber as well. And they tend to form sheets. They'll usually make about two to three sheets of smooth muscle. So we could add some more layers on here, and then we'd have three layers going through here, two or three layers. And these tapered ends, they're characteristic tapered ends, this allows for tighter packing. You can see the way that these smoothly fit together and pack together tightly then to form sheets of smooth muscle. Some other unique characteristics for smooth muscle cells are that they do not have transverse tubules and they have a very sparse sarcoplasmic reticulum. So I'm going to flip ahead. All right, I'll flip back to that previous slide in a second, but I wanted to quickly show you and remind you the properties of skeletal muscle. So the action potential is going to spread along that sarcolemma of the skeletal muscle and dip down into these transverse tubules or T-tubules. And that way, that signal can access the individual myofibril set. Now, also associated with those myofibrils, we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay? And remember, that's wrapped around the individual myofibrils as well, and that is full of calcium that can be released to lead to a contraction. Back to our smooth muscle cells again. So to reiterate, these cells have no transverse tubules or T-tubules. Instead, they have these invaginations of the uh, sarcolemma called caviole. Caviole means little caves. So you can see here these little dips into the surface of the smooth muscle cell. They also have a very sparse sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? So it's not as developed as we saw with the skeletal muscle cell that gives access to all those individual myofibrils. This is a source of calcium though for contraction the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but in addition, we also get calcium from the interstitial fluid. That is a source of calcium for contraction as well. We'll continue our comparison of smooth muscle to skeletal muscle, and now we'll turn to the filaments. Remember that with uh, skeletal muscle, we had the thick and thin filaments. Well, we have those again with an additional third filament here. So let's begin with the thick myosin filaments. Uh, on the left here, I am showing smooth muscle, thick myosin filaments, and we're comparing that to the skeletal muscle on the right. Okay. Now, what we see is that with smooth muscle, the thick filaments are longer, and then they have more myosin heads. We can see that there are myosin heads along the entire length of this thick filament, when we compare it to the smooth muscle, which has a shorter thick filament, and then the heads are just found at the, located at the ends or terminally. 
And what that allows for is more cross bridge formation within smooth muscle. And we can hypothetically have stronger contractions then, a more powerful muscle contraction. Uh, another kind of cool thing with the smooth muscle is those myosin heads, they have a modification that allows them to latch onto the thin filaments and remain attached without using additional ATP. And we call this the latch bridge mechanism. And we'll touch on this again later, but I just wanted to point it out here early on. Then let's turn to the thin actin filaments within smooth muscle here, shown on the left. Um, they are longer filaments and they have tropomyosin, though it does not block the cross bridge site. So maybe we have some tropomyosin on here, but it's not blocking the site where the myosin would bind to those actin molecules. Compare that then to our skeletal muscle and remember that we have our thin filament, so the actin molecules, then we have the tropomyosin, which does bind the um, myosin binding site until calcium is present. And we also have the troponin molecules. So the difference with our smooth muscle thin filaments is we do not have troponin. Okay? So though we do have tropomyosin, it doesn't block the myosin binding site, and there are no troponin molecules. The third type of filament we're going to talk about are these intermediate filaments that are found within smooth muscle. And these are just cytoskeletal framework. They're not actually involved with the contractions. So we'll touch on those in a moment, but I can point them out here on our spindle-shaped smooth muscle cells. Continuing then with our comparison of smooth muscle to skeletal muscle, we see that smooth muscle does not have striations. I know Dr. Christian pointed that out in our intro video. What we see is that the contractile proteins, I'll highlight them here in green, they're arranged between these dense bodies. Okay, and we'll talk about those shortly. But they're layered in this step-like fashion. Rather than the sarcomere, contractile unit that we see within skeletal muscle. You can see we also lack the Z lines that are found in skeletal muscle. And it's the lack of the sarcomere and the Z lines that lead to the unstriated appearance and gives them the characteristic smooth look. In the previous slide, I mentioned that our contractile proteins of the smooth muscle are found in between dense bodies. Dense bodies, um, they're actually made up of the same protein as the Z lines within skeletal muscle, and they're going to act as anchor points. So we can imagine we're going to have our contractile proteins found in between these dense bodies. And also, we're going to have those intermediary filaments that act as the scaffolding found between these as well. And then quickly I'll point out that we also have these dense plaques. And dense plaques also act as anchoring points, but it's to anchor the adjacent smooth muscle cells to each other. Here we have a three-dimensional cross-section, so we can kind of start looking at all the components of smooth muscle cells we've talked about and putting them together. So the first thing I want to point out here is we have that centrally located nucleus. And there's one per cell, and we see that our cells are arranged in two to three layers to form these smooth muscle sheets. Next thing I'll point out are these dense plaques. The dense plaques help connect the adjacent smooth muscle cells to one another. And then inside of the cell, we have those dense bodies. So I'll point those out there, those reddish, pinkish color. And then it's between these dense bodies that we would have our contractile filaments. So we would have our thin filaments. Those are what are actually connected to the dense bodies. And then in between those thin filaments, we have our thick filaments. Probably should have chose a color other than green. But... And then the last thing I'll point out is running between these dense bodies, we have our intermediate filaments that add that cytoskeletal support for those smooth muscle cells.
I don't know about you, but it's helpful for me to look at a few images that show these arrangements slightly differently of these different components. So let's just reiterate here. Here we have a cell, smooth muscle cell, showing our dense bodies. And it's kind of showing them externally. Just It's hard to do in an illustration. But remember that these are going to be running throughout every which way across that cell inside as well. Now between those dense bodies, we have the contractile proteins. So first, those that are actually connected to the dense bodies will be the thin filaments. Connected to that, we are going to have the thick filaments. And then again, connected to the next dense body, we have more thin filaments. So those are those contractile proteins found between the dense bodies. And then we're also going to have these intermediate filaments for cytoskeletal support running between some of these dense bodies as well as illustrated here. So you can imagine then, if we were to get actin sliding over myosin for a contraction, we're going to get this kind of three-dimensional contraction where this football-shaped cell is kind of going to shrivel up and twist as it contracts due to the arrangement of the contractile proteins. Here we have a slightly different illustration showing the same thing. So this smooth muscle cell here, we can see it's relaxed. And then we have our dense bodies. And between our dense bodies, we have our contractile proteins. So the first ones we see connected to the dense body are these thin filaments. And then in between them, we have our thick filaments. And then when we move to this contracted state, you can see that the thin filaments slide over one another, over the thick filaments, pulling those two dense bodies closer together to give us this three-dimensional contraction of the smooth muscle cell. Since we're now familiar with the components of a smooth muscle cell, we're going to look at how they interact to give rise to a contraction. Okay, let's take a minute then and put all of these components together to look at the mechanics of a contraction of a smooth muscle cell. We'll begin with a smooth muscle cell and a relaxed conformation. And I'm going to point out one relaxed contractile unit. And that is made up of the dense bodies and then those contractile proteins running between them, the thick and the thin filaments. Now if we zoom in on that contractile unit, we can see it is defined by these dense bodies that are connected to the plasma membrane of the cell, and then all of the thick and thin filaments and dense bodies running between those two points. Now, we then can zoom in on one of those series of thick and thin filaments, and we see that our thin filaments are interacting with that thick filament that has the heads all along its length. As these myosin heads pull the actin with a contraction, it's going to bring these dense bodies closer together. Okay? So we'll see now that our dense bodies are all brought closer together and that therefore brings the the wall, the plasma membrane of the smooth muscle cell closer together. So we've essentially shrunk the size of that cell in that dimension. So we get this three-dimensional contraction of the smooth muscle cell. Now we'll talk about the role of the myosin light chain. Recall that at the start of this lecture, I said that smooth muscle thin filaments do not have troponin and although they have tropomyosin, it does not block the crossbridge binding site on the actin thin filaments. So then, what prevents actin and myosin from binding in a resting state? Well, the myosin can interact with actin in smooth muscle only when it has been phosphorylated. Let me get that phosphate from ATP. So upon excitation, calcium binds to calmodulin. This is similar to the process with troponin. And then calmodulin activates uh, myosin light chain kinase, or the MLCK. MLCK phosphorylates the myosin light chain, allowing the myosin head to then bind actin. And we'll look at this stepwise in a second. Working through the step-by-step -step process of a contraction then, we'll start at the beginning with an action potential. 
And that stimulus is going to trigger the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. And that's going to allow for an influx of calcium into the cell. Uh, primarily, this calcium is going to come from this extracellular fluid, the interstitial fluid. And that's one of the differences between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. Most of that calcium within skeletal muscle would be coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we do get some from the sarcoplasmic reticulum here, that limited sarcoplasmic reticulum of the smooth muscle, but most is coming from the interstitial fluid. If you have your worksheet, you can pull it out, and we'll pick up where we left off with calcium entering the cell through the voltage-gated calcium channels. When calcium enters the cell, it binds to calmodulin. That's a protein specific to binding calcium. And it forms the calcium calmodulin complex. Now, the calcium calmodulin complex activates myosin light chain kinase. So we have an inactive myosin light chain kinase, and then because of the activation by calcium calmodulin complex, it is now active. And as kinases do, we know it's going to phosphorylate something. And what it's going to phosphorylate is this myosin light chain. So it's this lightweight protein that sits around the neck of our myosin head. Okay. Now, so the myosin light chain kinase uses ATP and adds a phosphate group to make that an active myosin light chain. It's phosphorylated now, and the myosin head can now bind to actin and form a cross bridge. I'm going to back up a minute here and give you a little more information about these light chains because I think this is going to be important to understanding how a contraction is regulated. So these lightweight chains of proteins, they're attached around the neck, you can see here in the green, of these myosin heads, kind of like a necklace. So it's around the neck region. And these light chains, we might have mentioned them with skeletal muscle. They, they have a little bit of importance there, but here their role is crucial in the function of smooth muscle. The smooth muscle can interact with actin only when we've phosphorylated this light change by adding this phosphate group via this myosin light chain kinase. Now don't confuse the phosphorylation of the myosin light chain with the ATP splitting that occurs at the ATPA site on the myosin head. So this phosphorylation via the myosin light chain kinase, that allows the myosin to bind with actin, whereas the splitting of ATP at the myosin ATPA site allows for the power stroke. It cocks that head to power that contraction. And we'll finish with a quick comparison of smooth versus skeletal muscle. And we'll finish today with a side-by-side -side comparison of smooth muscle to skeletal muscle. Just recapping the things we touched on earlier. This is the back side of your worksheet if you have it. So begin with uh, smooth muscle. Excitation occurs within both. However, within smooth muscle, there will be a rise in cytostolic calcium that is coming from the extracellular fluid predominantly, while with skeletal muscle, that's going to be coming from the intracellular sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Um, with skeletal muscle, that calcium is going to lead to a repositioning of the tropomyosin. So it's going to bind troponin, pull the tropomyosin away, and expose the myosin binding sites. Within smooth muscle, we saw that there's that series of events leading to the activated myosin light chain kinase, and we get phosphorylation of the myosin light chain that allows for cross bridge formation. Um, we see binding of actin and myosin to form cross bridges with both, and then finally contraction within both.